All right, the topic of this video is going to be over cellular metabolism. And anytime that we start talking about metabolism, the one thing that I lead off with is to kind of change how most people think about metabolism. So many people are quick to make the connection to fast metabolism. You burn off calories quickly. And if you have a slow metabolism, then you tend to hang on to extra weight easier. And that's kind of what society has turned metabolism into. And there is a lot more to metabolism than that. When you actually talk about metabolism, what you are looking at is you are looking at all the work that your cells do in a given day. So I mentioned before that cells are tiny little factories. They are constantly putting out product, building new material for your body to be able to use. And as they build those new products, they ship them out and they'll ultimately get delivered to where they need to be used in the body. So when you look at all that work over a 24 hour period, that's ultimately what metabolism is. So in the long run, the more work your cells are doing, the more calories you are going to burn. But that's not what metabolism actually is. The process of metabolism is taking the material that you give your body and being able to break it down. So working through that material to break it down into its individual components and then reassemble all of those things into materials that your body actually uses and will actually need. When we start talking about this, you have to consider that the foods you put into your body on a daily basis, there is very little out of that food material that you can use outright. So if there's water content in the food, yes, you can use that water. If there is glucose in that food, yes, you can use that outright. But your body needs so many materials that you can't get from foods. So when you build muscle tissue, when you build DNA and your chromosomes, when you build new organelles for your cells, there is nothing in the foods that you eat that are those materials. What your body has to do is it has to take whatever you put into your system, break it down to get to those individual elements that we have on the periodic table so that we get all of the calcium by itself. We get all of the carbon by itself. We get all of the sodium by itself. And if you think about all those different elements that are on the periodic table, anytime that you put food into your body, your body is going to break that down into those individual components. So then it can pick and choose and select those things that need to be put together so that you can build chromosomes and you can build muscle tissue because there is nothing that you eat that has the components in the right form to be able to just simply ingest it into your system and then use it as muscle or use it as organelles or any of that. So it is a process of being able to first break down material and then reassemble it in the right form. And that's ultimately what we're doing with metabolism. So when you look at the first two words that you have on there, it talks about two of the metabolic reactions that we go through. And one of them is to break down material and another one is to build it. But what we're doing is we're breaking it down and we're rebuilding it into something else. So when you look at, and I'm going to start with catabolism. Catabolism gives the definition of having a larger molecule and then breaking it down into smaller ones. And through that process, energy will actually be given off. So when you guys put food into your body, whatever it is, it is going to break that food down and it is going to break it down into those individual components. So if you eat something that has salt in it, salt and sodium chloride, it will break it down and get the salt by itself and the chlorine by itself. And so there's that process of taking that larger molecule, breaking it down into a simpler molecule or smaller molecules. Then on the flip side of that, you have the anab process of anabolism. And the definition of that is just that you have larger molecules that are going to come from smaller ones. So once you've broken down all of those foods, and if you think about what you would put into your body on in a typical meal, you sit down to a hamburger and french fries and a drink. You put all of those materials into your system and your body goes through the process of breaking it all down. 
and then you have all of those elements to pick from. So through the process of anabolism, you might take an element that came from your drink and you might take an element that came from that hamburger. You might take an element that came from the French fries and pull those three together to rebuild it and form it into something else, like I said, that your body can actually use. And so that's the process of anabolism. So catabolism, when we initially put it in, we break it down, get everything separated out. And then through the process of anabolism, your body can now select the materials it needs, rebuild it into something that is actually part of or usable in our body. The next two slides can look a little bit uh, intimidating when you get into it because you can see all of the different elements that are there and you've got all the stick models and all of that. You don't want to focus on this picture as a whole. What you ultimately want to look at are just two corners of the molecules that are shown there. So what you have with anabolism, as we talked about earlier, is you are going to be taking these smaller molecules and then linking them together to build a larger chain or a larger molecule. And the way that we do that is through the process of dehydration synthesis. So if you think about if you dehydrate something, just quickly in your brain, think about what happens through that process, dehydration, you are removing water. Now, why is that so important? In removing water, water is H2O. And we talked about the fact that when you have a water molecule, it is polar. The hydrogen side of water is going to behave positively because the oxygen pulls the electrons to itself. So it takes all the electrons, giving the oxygen side of a water molecule a negative charge or a negative pull. So the hydrogen side is positive. The oxygen side is going to be negative. Well, what happens is if you look at these you have a, two molecules on the left-hand side. You have two molecules on the right-hand side. And if you look at the very center, you'll notice that you have an H and then you have an OH just below that. And then right on the other side where it says dehydration, synthesis, and hydrolysis, you have another H and an OH. So what happens here is you have all the parts necessary to make a water molecule. So in order to take the left side and the right side and join those together and build a larger molecule, what the body will actually do is it will strip the hydrogen and the OH and it pulls those off of that molecule. When it does that, you have everything in the making for a water molecule. Those will form a water molecule and move away. Same thing will happen on the other side. So that H and OH, they get pulled off, they form a water molecule and they move away. So what happens is you have these two exposed ends and they will pull together and link as one larger molecule. So instead of having just two molecules on the left, two molecules on the right, once you strip those hydrogens and those OHs out of there, now those are going to be drawn to each other. They will pull together and link, and now you have a four chain molecule instead. So when we talk about taking those individual elements and linking them together, that is the process that's going to be used, dehydration synthesis. We're going to strip hydrogen and hydroxides out of there, allow them to form water molecules, those exposed edges, now have positive and negative charges to them, and they will then draw and pull together. So if we dehydrate it and we removed water in order to link them together, then the reverse process will allow us to break them apart. So in this particular case, we would start out with a larger molecule and we're going to introduce water to the situation. And in doing that, the water molecule will bind on to the exposed areas or the exposed ends and allow for a larger chain to break apart into smaller components. So it's just the reverse of what happened in anabolism. So if we strip water out and we dehydrate it, 
it allows for those molecules to link together. If we add water, that is going to break the molecules apart from each other. Water then fills back in on those exposed ends or hydrogens and hydroxides fill back in on those exposed ends and it breaks it apart into smaller components. The next slide that you have talks about the control of metabolic reactions. So when we talk about the process of metabolism, it does need to be regulated. So there are certain times where you want things to happen in the human body, and there are certain times where you don't want them to happen. And so you need to be able to have a way to regulate, kind of an on-off switch, of when certain things take place and when they need to be finished. And a lot of that is going to be controlled in the human body through the use of enzymes. Enzymes are made out of protein. They are molecules that uh, can be used to speed up the rate at, what a reaction, at which a reaction would normally take place. So the human body is not the most efficient thing in the world. And there's a lot of things that we do that actually take a very long time. If you think about digestion, digestion uses enzymes, but it still takes 12 hours. If the process of digestion did not use enzymes, it would actually take so long to be carried out that we would not be able to get enough energy to survive and to keep going. So even at 12 hours, that's with the use of enzymes to speed up the process and make it happen a little bit faster. So enzymes, like I said, they're protein based and they are going to speed up the rate at which a chemical reaction is able to happen within the human body. Now, when I initially say it's made out of protein, it doesn't sound like it's that important, but nothing in the body happens by chance. So every little thing that we talk about, every formation in the body, there's a reason behind it. And so when we talk about them being protein based, the reason that that's so important is it makes the enzymes durable. When you think about the fact that the human body is trillions of cells in size, and we are going to use thousands and millions of enzymes on a daily basis, if they were one-time use and you used an enzyme and it was worn out and you had to replace it, again, the body would not be able to keep up with the demands of that and we would not be able to survive. So the fact that this enzyme molecule can be used over and over and over again actually allows us to be able to sustain life. So the way that we regulate enzymes is we use a lock and key model. Enzymes have a very specific shape and the best visual I can give you is to think of all the keys that you have on your key ring right now. Probably have one for your car, one for your house or your apartment. Um, anything else that you might have, if you have a mailbox that requires a key, the way that keys work is they have a specific design, a specific cutout on the key that only matches one particular lock. So you know if you've ever tried the wrong key in a lock, it's not going to go very far and it's not going to unlock that door or whatever it is for you. So enzymes work on the very same idea. They have a specific shape. They can only be opened or used if you have the right key that fits into them to turn them on. Now, in the body, we don't say a lock and a key, we say an enzyme and a substrate. So the enzyme with its specific shape is looking for a key, a substrate that will fit into it. And once the substrate fits into the enzyme, now that enzyme is turned on and it will carry out its chemical reaction. But it has to wait for that substrate. It can't just start working whenever it wants to. And that is the way that we regulate what happens in the human body. So if there's no substrate present, that chemical reaction is not going to happen. Once the body wants that chemical reaction to take place, it releases the substrate, substrate finds the enzyme, locks into it, and now that chemical reaction will be carried out. The body also can regulate this by how much substrate it releases. So if it only needs the chemical reaction to happen in a small amount, it will release very few substrates. If there's only 10 substrates released, they can only match up with 10 enzymes. And so it's going to be a very small chemical reaction. If you need a very large response very quickly, now you can release thousands of substrates. They can bind with thousands of enzymes 
And so now that chemical reaction is going to be amplified because you have a lot more that are working to carry out that chemical reaction. So just a lot of ways that the body can regulate what's going on in the body and then also monitor how much of that particular reaction is allowed to happen at any one time. The next slide that you have talks a little bit more about the control of metabolic reactions. And you it shows the different enzymes that you have across the top. So you have enzyme A, B, C, and D. And then across the bottom, you have the multiple substrates and then leading you to the product. Ultimately, what's happening here is it's showing you kind of an assembly line. So that substrate one would have to find the right enzyme. That step would be carried out. And then once that step was carried out, then the next step would happen. And then the following step, and then the next one. But they would have to all wait for step one to happen before step two could take place before step three, and then ultimately getting to the final product that you wanted to be made in the human body. The, one of the most important things on this slide is just a little trick that you can use to be able to identify when you're talking about an enzyme. So if it has the suffix of ASE, so whatever it is, lipase, if it ends with that ASE suffix, that is your best indication that you are talking about an enzyme. Prefixes, because there's tons of prefixes that we have a lot of different types of enzymes in the body. But as soon as you see that ASE, you know you're talking about an enzyme, you know that it is speeding up a chemical reaction somewhere in the body. The next slide talks about denaturation. And basically what denaturation is, is a situation where something affects the enzyme and it changes the shape of the enzyme. So if you think about that lock, we talked about the lock and key model earlier. If you were to take a file and put it into that lock and file it down, the next time you go to use that key, it's not going to work because you changed the shape of that lock. And so now that key is not going to be able to work anymore. Denaturation is that exact process. It's something that happens in the human body that changes the shape of the enzyme and then the substrate can't fit into it any longer. And so whatever chemical reaction that enzyme was supposed to carry out, it can't because that substrate can't lock in. If the substrate doesn't fit in, can't turn it on, enzyme doesn't work. So in the human body, some things that will denature or change the shape of an enzyme, the top two are pH and temperature. So when you have a change in pH in the human body, that will denature your enzymes. If you change the temperature of the body too much, that will denature enzymes. And there's some others on the list, um, radiation exposure, electricity, um, coming in contact with certain chemicals, those can also denature enzymes. But the two most um, common ones are pH and temperature. So this is why when you have somebody who is suffering from a fever at a very high temperature, you really start to worry because when they get into the 104 range, what happens is they are denaturing the enzymes. Those enzymes can't work but they are getting denatured at a faster rate than what your body is able to replace them with. At 105, it's happening even faster. And at 106, the enzymes are being denatured so fast that now enough chemical reactions are not able to happen that things will start shutting down in the body. And if you stay in that 106 range for too long, you're probably not going to be with us any longer. Now, that's in an adult body. In a child under one, at a temperature of 101, 102, you really have to start worrying. That's going to be about the equivalent of 106 fever in an adult. The next slide that you have uh, talks about energy for uh, metabolic reactions. And when we talk about the energy in the human body, our fuel source is a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And with that molecule, that is what your body is trying to build. Because like I said, that's going to be the fuel source that is going to supply all the energy needs that your body needs 
to carry out a variety of jobs. So if you look at the following slide, it talks about ATP molecules. Now, I already mentioned the name adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine is a base that the three phosphates, so tri indicates three phosphates. You have a tail of three phosphate molecules that are attached to that adenosine base. So what happens is phosphates have lots of bonds to them. It's oxygen and phosphorus bonded together, and there are a ton of bonds. In the world of chemistry, bonds will help hold energy. So if you break bonds, there is a release of energy, and then that energy can be harnessed to do work. So in the case of adenosine triphosphate, your body builds these little fuel molecules, and then when you need energy, it will snap off one of those phosphates, breaking those bonds, that energy is released or given off, and now you can utilize that energy to drive a process or do some work somewhere else in the body. So that is the overall goal of what we're trying to do in the human body. The process that we use in order to build ATP is called cellular respiration. As soon as I say the word respiration, people think breathing, inhaling, exhaling. And when you add the term cellular in front of that, what we're doing is we are now taking the process all the way down to the cellular level. Obviously, it's not inhaling, exhaling any longer, but we are still utilizing that oxygen in order to build those ATP molecules. So respiration that we do on the level that we can see, that's getting oxygen into our lungs, but it doesn't stop there. We have to take that oxygen from our lungs. We have to transfer it into our bloodstream. Bloodstream gives the oxygen a ride to our cells. Once we get that oxygen into our cells, that's actually where it's put to use. So that oxygen gets delivered to the organelles in our cell, and then it can actually do what it's supposed to do. There are three steps in the process of cellular respiration. They are glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Now, with glycolysis, you have a suffix and a, a prefix and a suffix that have been sandwiched together here. You have glyco, that is your prefix. Glyco is going to indicate that you have glucose, basic form of sugar. So anytime that you see glyco attached to a word, you know that sugar is involved. The suffix lysis, L-Y-S-I-S, that means to break or destroy. So if you define this term, it literally means that you are breaking or destroying a glucose molecule. Now, the reason that we do that, if you take that glucose molecule and you break it or destroy it, you're breaking the bonds, you're releasing energy, and that's really going to kick off the process of cellular respiration. Now, in the next slide, I put a picture in of what happens in glycolysis. And it's, again, easy to get lost in this if you're trying to track everything and all the arrows and the abbreviations and everything that you have going on, it's easy to get overwhelmed. But essentially what you have going on here is you have a sugar molecule that is going to change forms as it moves through the process of cellular respiration. So it starts out as glucose, it gets broken down into something called pyruvate. So that is the broken version of glucose. And then you're going to see some things like NAD, FAD, NADPH, FADH. And now that's kind of where the overwhelming part can come in because you're looking at those, you don't know what they mean. This one has a positive attached to it. Why is it positive? If you take a moment and think about how you got to class tonight, most of you would say that you came to class in a car. So your car is a mode of transportation. It gets you from one location to another. So I want you to take that idea and now think of FAD, NAD, FADH, all of those as the equivalent of being a car. 
they are a mode of transportation in a cell to get things from one point to another. That's all they do. In the case of a cell, what we're transporting is electrons, those tiny little negative charges. We need to get as many of those as we can in one location. And so all of those NAD, FADs, all of those molecules are going to pick up electrons, transport them from one location to a very specific location inside the cell. So anytime you see those throughout the process, don't get lost in the letters, just think of them as cars. Then if you'll find the slide that talks about the citric acid cycle. Again, a lot of abbreviations, a lot of arrows going all different directions. Don't get lost in that. When you look at this one, just consider that this is a cycle, hence the name citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. It happens two times. So this process will happen once and then it will repeat and go through a second time. That's why we refer to it as a cycle. With both glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, what you're really trying to do, this, these are the prep phases. You're getting all of the pieces in the right positions, especially those electrons. So even though, like I said, there's a lot going on, essentially what's happening in these first two steps is we're breaking things down, getting the energy that we need from them, and then getting those electrons, pulling those together, and getting them delivered to the right spot. Now, at the end of glycolysis, you do build two ATP molecules. So we have two of those fuel cells that are built by the time we get to the end of glycolysis. Then we get to the end of the Krebs cycle. One cycle equals one ATP. I told you that it happens twice. So the products go through that same cycle two times. So we get another two ATP molecules by the time we're through Krebs. So we're building those fuel molecules, ATP. And then that pulls us into the last one, which is the electron transport chain. Now, what happens with the electron transport chain? You'll notice right off the bat, electrons. This is where all of those electrons we were picking up in those cars really comes into play. And this is very much like a staircase. So the electrons get dropped off at the top of that staircase. And then hanging out at the bottom is going to be that oxygen molecule. So you inhale that oxygen molecule, people think that they just need to get oxygen to their lungs and that's where it ends. Nope, that oxygen has to go all the way into your cells. It's going to end up at the bottom of that staircase in the electron transport chain. And it is going to help maneuver those electrons from the top of that staircase all the way down. If you look at that picture though, every time that those electrons drop a stair, look at the energy. They're actually giving off energy. So every time they move down a step on that staircase, they're giving off energy. The reason that that is so important is because all of that energy is going to be harnessed and that is going to be used to build ATP. By the time we get done with the electron transport chain, we have built 32 to 34 ATP molecules. Far more efficient than glycolysis, which builds two, and the Krebs cycle, which gives us two. So we get down to the electron transport chain and now all of a sudden we get 32 to 34. It's a massive jump. So this part of cellular respiration is very, very important because we get so many more, so many more ATP molecules from that particular step. The reason that it's a range of 32 to 34 is our body has two structures that use or require more ATP than other body parts. That's our liver and our muscles. So by design, they actually have become more efficient at building ATP, and so they can build 34. So most of your cells are going to be 32, but the liver and the muscles have actually evolved a little bit to be more efficient at the process because they have higher energy demands, and so they can build 34. The last slide that you have there uh, for cellular respiration talks about anaerobic uh, reactions. And this is a situation where 
you're not able to get enough oxygen into your system. You guys think about when you do physical activity. So if you go out for a run or if you sprint, what's one change that you notice in your body very quickly? You're going to start inhaling and exhaling much faster. Reason for that is you're making your muscles work hard. Okay, harder than if you're just sitting. So as soon as those muscles start working, what are they using? They're using fuel. So they are burning off those ATP molecules. As soon as you start burning off those ATP molecules, your body recognizes that, wants to replace the ones that you're burning off. So it will increase your process of cellular respiration. If oxygen is the driving force behind that electron transport chain, now the body's saying, we've got to get more oxygen in so we can build more ATP molecules. That's why you start breathing faster. Your body is responding to you burning off ATP, trying to get more oxygen into your cells so that you can replace the ATP that you are using. So that's why that breathing rate increases. Now, if something happens, you push your body harder and faster, then you can get the oxygen into your cells. That oxygen is not available, you have to resort to something else. And so what will happen is you will start using sugar to drive the whole process instead of oxygen. The problem with that is we're designed to get rid of the waste product of cellular respiration when we're using oxygen the way that we should. You exhale, you kick out that carbon dioxide every time you breathe out. We are not designed to get rid of the waste product that comes from having to burn sugar. When you guys have to burn sugar, you build something called lactic acid. We don't have a way to get rid of that. So that will actually sit in your tissues. That's why after you do a hard workout, you lift or run or use muscles that you haven't used before, they're sore the next couple of days because that lactic acid has built up in that muscle tissue and you are feeling the soreness from that lactic acid being present. If you've also ever heard the phrase, feel the burn, that is very true. Because again, when you are working hard and you are building up that lactic acid, okay, think about acid on our pH scale. pH scale ran zero to 14. Acid was below seven. So from zero to that 6.9 range on the pH scale. So if you are building up that lactic acid, that pH, is moving into that acidic side, we should be at 7.4, slightly basic. You start getting that lactic acid in your system. That is where that feel the burn comes from is you can feel that acid building in your tissues. I know that there's a little bit more about DNA, but that ties into our cells. And so I'm going to wait and pick that up when we get into our cells information. So make sure that this packet comes back with you um, at our next class and also check Blackboard for your assignment that will be posted for this week.